leaving out the, uh, the intro. Oh, yeah, that is that's, funny. That's only for our paid uh, subscribers that I get that. <laughs> that is so funny. Along those lines, I'll just tell you, Inger actually had chat GPT write this. This is my wife had a her had chat GPT write a poem about me. And it was it was so embarrassing. But uh, anyways, well, thank you for the intro. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on myself before we dive into this. But the topic today is uh, on financial modeling. Um, the reason that that Taylor and Spencer are asking me to do that is I, I at a company called Forecaster, and that's what we do. We make financial modeling easy for startup founders um, specifically. And so we'll talk a little bit about financial modeling. Um, a little background on myself. Uh, my name is Jeff Erickson, and I'm, uh, like I said, with Forecaster. Prior to joining Forecaster about a year and a half ago, I was with a company called Carta. That if you're a startup, you probably are familiar with Carta. Um, it does cap table management software. Um, and before that, um, I, I was an entrepreneur, or I guess I still kind of am, and uh, ran a company for about 10 years. My wife and I um, started the company together. Uh, we ended up selling that company to a private equity group. And it was in the consumer product space. I wanted to get back into tech, and that's why I went to to Carta. Um, and then while I was at Carta, I met this cool company called Forecaster. And the best way I can describe it is it is kind of the Carta of financial modeling. So if you can imagine, uh, Carta takes all of your cap table data, puts it into an easy to use software platform. So it makes it a lot easier, more efficient for you and your attorney to, you know, keep your cap table up to date. So Forecaster is kind of doing the same thing with financial models. We're taking financial models out of spreadsheets where they often get broken and uh, they can be hard to manage and you know run different scenarios and figure out which scenario you're, wor you're working on. Taking it out of that platform into an easy to use software platform that makes financial modeling easy so you can run all your scenarios and all kinds of stuff like that. So. So that's why we're talking a little bit about financial modeling today. Um, it sounds like I've got like 10 minutes or so. And we can kind of go through kind of the basics. And then I wanted to make sure we have plenty of room for Q&A um, here on the back end. Um, Spencer, Taylor, are there anything specifically we wanted to make sure we, we hit on as we go through financial modeling? I think um, with your experience, Jeff, as it applies to um, kind of early days and founders, um, maybe we talk, you know, focus in on the um, kind of first round and um, haven't yet, you know, hired full-time CFO founders trying to figure all this out, needs to know their numbers, and then we can go where the questions take us. Okay, perfect. So I think that's a that's a great place to start because one of the things that you will you will hear from anybody that does financial modeling is that there's one thing you can guarantee, and that is that your financial model is wrong. Every investor knows it. Every founder should know it. Some some think that they have the perfect model that isn't wrong, but your model will always be wrong. So if a hundred percent of of financial models are wrong. You might ask, well, then why in the world would we create a financial model if it's going to be wrong? Well, the saying goes that all financial models are wrong, but some are useful. And so you want to be able to create a financial model that is useful. And one of the things that you're going to find useful is that if you are going to be raising capital, um, especially as you, as you get into like the, you know, any institutional rounds where, you know, they're going to be interested in diving in a little bit deeper, um, they're going to require a financial model. You're going to have to go through, especially in this economic environment where due diligence has, has gotten a lot tougher and, and tighter. They've tightened up their, their check writing um, folks. And, and so the due diligence process, it, it dives into the financial model pretty deeply, um, you know, especially if you're kind of going into that series A round. For your first time, you know, your first raise, 
sometimes you can get away with, you know, maybe not having the best financial model in the world um, where, you know, you, you still need to kind of know how your business works. Um, but the, again, it goes back to the key elements of your, of your financial model. First off, your financial model is super helpful in making decisions about your business. So it's how you can actually understand your, your business is you create something on, you know, in a spreadsheet or in a software platform that models out, you know, what happens if we have, you know, if we went and spent $4,000 a month on paid ads, what would we, what would happen to our business? Is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? Um, would we just, you know, spend $4,000 and not get anything out of it? Well, if you've got some history then, you know, you've tried this, maybe you spent $1,000 the last three months, you can see what those results are. And then you can start to use some of that data to project going forward. And so one of the key elements of your financial model is to have some history. So you want to have something that you can kind of, or at least some good assumptions where maybe somebody else has the history. So if you've got a good um, competitor, for example, and you know that they spend X amount in, you know, or maybe they, they acquire, they have five sales reps and this is what their sales start to look like with each sales rep when they add a new sales rep, you can start to make some assumptions that will go into a financial model. And then you can start to build out something that says, okay, if we added, you know, another sales rep, what could we expect out of this? And so you're basically using um, historical information to project things going forward in the future. Typically, this has always been done in spreadsheets. So most founders are not Excel or Google Sheet wizards. And so it can be kind of challenging. So there's two options that a lot of early stage founders will take. One, they will go look up some templates on, online and pull a financial modeling template and say, okay, I've got a SaaS company. Let me find a SaaS financial model template and I'll try and build one from scratch. It takes a lot of time, energy. Um, and if you're not really good at this and you don't do it all the time, um, you might not end up with the best model for me helping you make good decisions. On the, the other side of things, um, a lot of times a, an investor might say, hey, well, let's go through your financial model. And the founder will go, great, I need a financial model. So they'll go to a fractional CFO and I'll typically pay five to 10 grand for a financial model to get built out. And it takes a lot of time for the, the CFO or, or whoever's build it, building it. And then what the founder gets back is a, a spreadsheet with like 30 tabs in it and they have no idea how to use it. And so when they go in and try to figure it out, then all of a sudden they start getting circular references or something happens. They're like, Oh no, now it doesn't work. I broke it. And so now you've got to, uh, you have to go back to the CFO, spend more money to get them to fix it and maybe even teach you how to use it. If, if you're going to use it long-term. So those are the two scenarios that we see way too often. And so where forecaster kind of comes in is, and I'll show you Spencer. I just, or Taylor, I just saw you say, could you show us an example? Um, I'll show you kind of where Forecaster kind of comes in and, and makes this a lot easier for, for founders. Um, I'll share my screen here. Let's see if I've got, okay. So this is an example of, of a Forecaster financial model um, where you, ideally you're going to put in all of the assumptions right up here. and it's going to kick out one, a dashboard where you can kind of see things like, okay, based on my assumptions, I, this is how much runway I have. Here's how many months it's going to take to get me to profitability given these assumptions. And then more importantly, it's going to kick out your financial statements. Um, so one of the things that, that a lot of founders make the mistake of is just doing a PL or a profit and loss statement. And they think, okay, I'm going to model out my company and I've got a good profit and loss. You know, here's my income, here's my expenses, here's what the, the end result looks like at the end of every month. And what they forget is that 
just because they make a sale does not always make that turn into cash right away. And so there are things that you have to factor into your financial model that are, you know, when are you going to collect on that? Just because you sell something for $5,000, what if they, you know, you don't get that $5,000 right up front all the time? What if they're paying you in increments or in, you know, maybe two months from now, you've got net 60 terms or something like that. Well, those types of things can get factored into your model and it will show you you know, what your cash flow statement would look like. So your model, you want to be able to fit into your income statement and show, you know, what your, your sales look like and your expenses every month. But then ultimately you want to see what, what your cash impact is because you're, as a CEO or a founder, your number one responsibility is to not run out of cash. Um, whether you're getting cash from sales um, or from fundraising, or from grants, or however you're getting cash, you have to stay on top of your cash and make sure you're not going to run out of cash because that's the death of your business. And so that's where your cash flow statement becomes really important. And you can see that if you've built a, a model, you want to have the three statements be your output where you get your income statement, your balance sheet, which is going to tell you your you know, up to date cash balance, but then your model will show you your cash flow projections and show you, you know, what, you know, if you've got enough cash over the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, and where you might need to raise capital um, or, you know, where you might run into to challenges. So that's kind of a, a quick thing that the other thing that's kind of cool about having it in software is you can do things like you know, if you go into your, your income statement, you can pull in your actuals like real time. So it hooks up to your QuickBooks or Xero or your accounting software. And you say, okay, what was our actual? And you see what your projected um, results were and how you stacked up. And you can actually even do a variance and say, okay, how did we do in terms of our expenses or, or different things in our, in our model? So Kind of nice having things in software. Um, as we go through, and I'll just take a few more minutes here to explain kind of how you build out a financial model. Um, if you've ever presented to a, an, a potential investor, you'll, you, you probably know that you typically want to know the market size. And one of the mistakes that a lot of founders make in terms of creating a financial model is they know that they need a revenue slide or a financial slide in their pitch deck. And so they'll put together a hockey stick graph that says, here's how our revenue is going to go up over the next you know, three to five years. Um, and they'll do that based on a, what's called a top-down approach. They'll say, okay, we've got a, you know, a $150 million market and we're going to take you know, 10% of that market and here's what that's going to result in, in terms of our revenue over the next five years. Um, I'll just tell you right now that for investors, that doesn't fly. Um, they want to know how many customers does that mean? Um, how are you going to get those customers? Um, you know, how are you going to monetize those customers? And what we're, what we're talking about there is building what's called a bottoms up financial model. So starting with right here, your customer acquisition, that's kind of where you can start building a map model is how are you going to get customers? And so you might have different ways to do that. It might be through customer referrals. Maybe you're doing email marketing. Maybe you've got a partnership program where partners are referring. Maybe you have a reseller program. Um, maybe you're paying influencers. How are you going to get customers? And so that's a good place to start when you're building out a model. And you can say, okay, if we do these certain things, if we hire a sales rep, for example, they're going to make 100 calls. Out of those 100 calls, we're going to get three people that book a, a demo with us. Out of those three people, one person is going to sign up. And so how many calls do we have to make every month in order to hit a certain amount of, of sales? So those are the types of things that you can do when you're talking about customer acquisition. How are we going to get customers? Um, you know, same thing with, with 
you know, if it's email marketing or paid ads, you know, if we spend, we can do some tests and say, if we spend a thousand dollars, we get this many clicks that result in this many, you know, demo requests or whatever it is, or, or sales people that sell our, or buy our, our product. And then you can kind of extrapolate that from that and say, okay, we spend a thousand dollars and we get five customers. Let's try and spend $2,000. Do we get 10 customers? And does that make it worth it for us? Should we keep spending, you know, on these ads or should we do something different? So those are, those are some ways you can kind of look at your customer acquisition from there in a bottoms up approach, you will look at your revenue streams. So from your customers, how do you monetize those customers now? Are they going to be a one-time purchase where, you know, it's like we spend, you know, $500 to get this one customer and they spend a thousand dollars with us um, and we make $500. Is that a good model? Well, it depends on your expenses, which you can come down here and you can kind of figure out your expenses as well. Um, but going back to your, your revenue, you might have a customer where you might have an upfront fee and you pay and they pay $5,000 upfront for your product or service. But then there are monthly add-on things where 50% of those customers end up also buying something else from you. Maybe it's an ongoing service where they are paying monthly, but those are all types of ways that you can monetize your, your customers so once you've got, you figured out your customers and how you you're getting them, you can now kind of start to build out how you are monetizing those customers. That is really what goes into your revenue model. As you start to build out your revenue model, which is probably the most important piece of your financial model is how you build that revenue. It's not the only piece because you could have a ton of revenue coming in and you can still be losing money. And so that's where you go into things like, okay, well, what do our, what does our payroll look like? What does our, you know, what are our people recommend or people requirements going to be? And you can tie some of that potentially to your revenue where you say, okay, if we have this many customers, that means we need X number of, you know, support people. And in order to get that many customers, how many salespeople do we need? Um, in order to, you know, hit these certain benchmarks, what other types of people are we going to need? And if, if we get to where we're hiring 50 people, do we now need an HR person? Um, and so you can start to build out things like that in your model as well. Um, and you can start tying the expenses on how much is that this specific person going to cost? Um, you know, and then you can kind of build that into your model as well. And then ultimately you've got your expenses that you'll, you'll plug in here. Um, again, these are things that can also tie back into potentially revenue, potentially your employees with each new employee. Maybe they, they each need a new laptop and they need a new laptop every two years. So you build that into your model. Um, you know, what other expenses do you have? You know, as you start to bring on new clients, you hit a certain point, do you start to need an attorney that you're spending more on? Um, do you start to need accounting services? Do you start to need you know, more, you know, are, are, do you need more space? Do you need to start paying for rent because now you've got 10 employees? Um, so there's all types of things like that that start to factor in. And as you put all of it together, then you can ultimately come out, you know, with, you know, your financial statements where you start to kick out an income statement where all of this comes together and you say, okay, here's our revenue that we're projecting over the, the coming you know, year or so. And here are our cost of sales. Here's our, um, ultimately our um, expenses. And at what point will we eventually become, you know, a profitable company? Um, why this becomes important for you as a founder is one, it helps you to understand your business, um, to know what are the key levers in your business that create, you know, a profitable entity down the road. When will you be profitable? Um, investors are diving into this right now. Um, I'll just tell you from in the environment we're in today, uh, you're going to get asked about profitability. It's like, what is this? How does this company, you know, get to profitability at some point? 
And what does it look like? And so being able to go back to your model and say, you know, we are projecting that, you know, we, we bring in $400,000 of, of capital. We spend it this way and you can plug that into your model of how you're going to spend it. And this is what we expect the, you know, the cash usage to look like. And it's going to last us for 24 months or whatever it comes out to be. Um, you know, that's kind of the use case of, of you building a financial model. Um, I'm going to pause here and Spencer, I, um, I don't know if we've got questions that are coming in, but we can kind of dive in deeper to something or maybe we yeah. can kind of address some of the questions at this point. This has been great so far, Jeff. Thank you. Parker had a question that he put in the comments and then I have maybe a follow-up or related question. So he's, he asked, uh, if we're looking to build a financial model for a strategic acquisition, so rather than raising money, what would be expected? Is it all the same things or is it a little more lenient on financials as long as it fits into a strategic goal for the, I'm guessing, for the acquiring company? Gotcha. Okay, that's a great question because, I mean, there, you know, obviously, if you're going to be raising capital, you're going to want to know how much you need to raise and how you're going to use that capital, right? On the an acquisition, it becomes equally, if not more important, because you're looking at one, what is the historical, you know, what, what's the historical performance of the company? And what does that look like going forward? There are things when you're looking at an acquisition that you're going to, to really hone in on. Some of the things are going to be you're you're going to dive in deep to some of the expenses. You might look at you know, okay, can we do things more efficiently than have been done in the past? What if we, you know, what if we already have somebody on our staff that, you know, we're the acquiring company that does all the accounting and we've got three people doing accounting at this company that we're going to acquire. Could we run a scenario now where we, you know, we don't need two of those people because we've already got that built into ours and we, maybe we only need one person because we have better infrastructure that we can plug everything into. And so now you're taking advantage of some of those things that you have as an acquiring company, and you're running a model based on where are some of the synergies and what are some of the assumptions we can make in terms of cost cutting or maybe being more efficient in different places. And what does that look like in terms of our profitability? So those are some of the things that you're going to look at in terms of a model uh, from an acquisition standpoint, you might also look at, you know, do we have additional channels of, of sales that we could plug into this model and say, okay, we have, you know, 20 different partner relationships that we could plug this company into and they could start selling their products. What does that look like in terms of an increase in sales for this company? And so now you can start to run some of those scenarios and say, does this acquisition make sense? Is that helpful? Yeah, that is. Thanks. That's really helpful. Jeff, you opened up by saying, and, and I've heard it said differently, you know, that a business plan doesn't survive first contact with a customer. Everything kind of goes out the window when you actually get real and deliver product. Um, is that kind of what you were saying with creating your financial model initially it's going to be wrong or bad you create it anyway you need like can you talk more about the idea of like done is better than perfect yeah great point and i love that analogy that you brought up because i think there's some similarities there um because initially you might have some assumptions in your your model especially if you're super early you might be guessing or you might be going off of you know, research that you've done that says, you know, here's a, a good click-through rate that we could expect. Um, or, you know, here's what your typical SDR might generate if you're a SaaS company. So you're going off of these assumptions, but when you get into real life and you start implementing that, maybe you make your first sales hire. Now you have some real data that says, okay, we thought this was going to be a three-month ramp for them to start to really be growing. It's actually more like a six-month ramp. Um, but now, you know, so if you go back and you hire another SDR, you can build that in and say, it's actually a six month ramp where they get up to really being, being, you know, able to fully contribute, or you might say, oh, maybe it's only a two month ramp, 
But now you've got historical data that you can make better assumptions off of. Again, I don't think you're ever going to have a perfect financial model where it matches up, where everything's 100% right. It's kind of like picking the, you know, the, the uh, perfect bracket in March Madness. Um, everything's probably not going to line up exactly, but your financial model should get better and better and better every month as you get more and more data. And so that's really the benefit of having a financial model that you keep up to date. Um, again, I'll go back to one of the benefits of using software is you can tie it into your QuickBooks and pull that data in every month. And so now you've got that new data that comes in and it says, okay, we thought our customer acquisition cost was going to be, you know, $53. Well, we saw that the last three months, it's been 47, 46, and $43. It's trending down. So do we, should we make an adjustment to our model that our customer acquisition cost is actually lower than what we are expecting? And now our model gets more and more accurate as we get that data. Um, and, and maybe the next month, it jumps up to 51. And you have to kind of go, oh, okay, what happened? So now you can kind of go... Um, you know, what changed over this month, but now as a, as a manager um, or a founder of a company, you can start to see the data and then figure out why, why the data is telling the story that it is. So Jeff, can I interrupt for just a second? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, dude, I have to maybe jump off to something. And I, I just wanted to say that uh, I love the idea of the bottom up top down doesn't work. So I completely agree with that, it, but it all depends on your assumption. Yeah. You have these beautiful assumptions and they sound really great, but when you actually go to vet them, you find out well, that's where it doesn't actually meet. Like the businessman, meet, the business plan meet the market <laughs> because yeah. you yeah, really have to vet those. So anytime you talk to anybody, you have to say, here are my assumptions and here's what I did to vet every one of these assumptions so that it actually means something. And frankly, I've never had clarity beyond 12 months. I always knew within 12 months, this is what I'm going to do. But the rest after 12 months was all just guesswork. I mean, I love that you go out two and three and five years and whatever. And I used to laugh with bankers about this stuff. We just call them projections. But it's all BS beyond that beyond that window. And, and the fact is that I never missed my numbers, but it never, ever happened the way I said it was beyond 12 months. <laughs> Which is why you have to always be updating your model so that you're taking real information or new conversations. You know, you have pre-revenue and you got new information. You have to back that into your model. And I'm, I'm so sorry that I have to run. I really wanted to support you because I love you, dude. Oh, no, this is awesome. <laughs> I, this I is can't great. imagine anybody not using a freaking forecaster if, they're doing, if they have a SaaS product. I just can't believe it. I wish it worked for what I'm doing right now. <laughs> I really do. But I have to stay in spreadsheets. I'm such a loser. <laughs> I would for sure use forecasters. So, yeah, I had huge kudos for what a great platform it is. I've looked at it really carefully. Anyway. Well, hey, Robert, I, I love what you were saying that, you know, the, the quicker you're and like the shorter the period, the more accurate you can hopefully be um, as you get out into the, you know, three year, five year projections. It's hard. I mean, you've got assumptions and tons of variables that you don't know what's going to happen that far it's, out. It's all BS. <laughs> yes. It's now, a nice I will mental say, exercise, but it never happens. The way yes. you think it's now, I will to. say it is a good exercise. Yeah. Um, like you alluded to, and investors were required. Because, and part of that is investors want to know where you're thinking. Like, are you thinking that, okay, we validate over the next 12 months and we get we hit our revenue targets? And is there something more to that? Are you thinking about, you know, have you, you know, once you capture this market, maybe you're going after a beachhead and you, you pin that down and that's what your 12 month forecast looks like? Well, what's what's after that? What are the opportunities? And is this a big enough opportunity for me as a different type of investor to say, okay, these guys are thinking big enough that sure, they're but remember, I'm not the guy going after investors. I want to yeah. bootstrap the thing. And to me, that's why this data is so, so critical because you have to have cash every month. Yes. 
And so yep. I'm thinking bootstrap. And if an investor comes into the picture in my five tech companies that I've done with exits to date, three were bootstrapped, two had a single super angel invest, or two had a single super angel investor. That's my experience. Ever met with institutional, I mean, I met with them, but I would never take their money. <laughs> These institutional investors. Yeah. That's it's just me. So anyway, sorry, sorry for the interruption. No, I got, that's I got great, Robert. Great got it. Love it. Thanks, that. Robert. Yeah. Um, thanks everyone for coming, Jeff. This has been great. And it, it's, uh, it feels like we always kind of have to cut these short, but I think that is a great opportunity for the people then to connect with you. Uh, you've got your intro or your, uh, connection information here. They can connect with you via warmly. Um, and on LinkedIn, if you're not already connected with Jeff, um, shares great insights and he's always out in the community. So we appreciate you coming and supporting this community. Um, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Also want to say thanks to Kiln for being a partner of uh, Midday Connect. And uh, I know we've got a lot of folks on here today who are already Kiln members, but if you're not a member of Kiln, go ahead and check it out and connect with our friend Weston and he can get you a day pass if you're down in Lehigh. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks, Taylor. Appreciate you.